impressed by the Salk Institute and some wonderful researchers there. Uh, you can see that uh, Dr. Cage's project uh, is titled Infectious History as a Determinant of Age Related Inflammation in Alzheimer's Disease. We are very, very pleased tonight to award her our top award. It's a $300,000 award that we're calling the Roger and Dean Denny Ackerman Award. And so uh, very glad that uh, Ms. Ackerman could join us tonight. And Dr. Cage, uh, we would love to hear from you and uh, the work that you've got planned for this year. Great, well, thank you so much. Um, I need to be able to share the screen. I just wanna say what an honor it is. Um, I was uh, not only surprised to get the award in the first place, to go through the final, the final selection in the first place, but also then to hear how, how well received uh, this, this, these ideas were to, um, to the review committee. What, um, I'm an immunologist. I, I'm not uh, an Alzheimer's disease researcher, but what I have been wanting to do, and in fact, a big part of the reason why I moved from Yale University to the Salk Institute was because of the um, ex excellence in neuroscience and, and neurobiology research that goes on at the Salk Institute and how I might be able to, to cross over into this and to, to uh, learn more about neuroinflammation and the regulation of brain health by our immune cells that are in the brain. And so that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. And as I started to become more involved with other neuroscientists at, at the Salk, uh, many that have been funded through CART before, like um, uh, Nic Nicola Allen and, and Greg Lemke and, and Rusty Gage, we, um, it started to make me think about some of the ways of, of the work that I do or what I've been trained to do and have been thinking about for many years, how it might be able to integrate more into our understanding of neuroinflammation and how that could be contributing perhaps to Alzheimer's disease. So this is a, it's a great um, opportunity for me to, um, without, without money like this, your, your lab can't actually start to expand and to, to study new ideas. And so I really wanna thank you for this opportunity. Um, I'm a professor and director of the NOMA Center for Immunobiology and Microbial Pathogenesis at the Salk Institute. And what we've been thinking a lot about, um, especially um, with many groups, uh, with many investigators at the Salk Institute, is how we know that Alzheimer's disease, the number one risk factor for Alzheimer's disease is age. It's an age-related disease. And there's so many fundamental aspects of our normal physiology and cellular biology that are changed with age that we know that these different age-related processes are all together in this complex disease um, operating in different ways and influencing one another in different ways to control the health of the brain and neurodegeneration. And inflammation is probably the number one hallmark of aging that is, is a cardinal hallmark that is seen over and over again in tissues as, as one ages, including the brain. And we know that Alzheimer's disease, while there is clearly a genetic risk and there are certain genes that have been found to contribute to early onset Alzheimer's disease. We also know that that's a small percentage of the actual cases of Alzheimer's disease and rather the majority are, while still genetically regulated, are largely influenced by the environment and other um, external factors that are occurring that we live with, that we are associate with and change with age. And so that's really kind of been the basis of the idea is to think about how infectious history, we've been thinking a lot about infection uh, this past year, but how infectious history and the viruses and the pathogens that we encounter just as a normal part of life, how could this actually be contributing to this hallmark property of aging that we refer to as inflammation, uh, which is the abnormal and aberrant production of immune related molecules that are produced by cells of our immune system, but also by non by non immune cells as well. So there's many different types of cells that can produce inflammatory factors that contribute to um, inflammation. And so it's been known for a while that Alzheimer's disease is associated with inflammation and chronic inflammation. That chronic inflammation can lead to to um, neurodegeneration and to and to death of, of neurons, and that this can be counteracted by by beneficial anti-inflammatory immune processes as well. And so what we wanted to understand was, well, what are the, the environmental factors? What are some, we know there's gonna be many, but what are some environmental factors that could modulate this type of inflammation, this chronic inflammation that's associated with age and could viral infection and the, the, just the normal series of infections that we encounter over our lifetime lead to this age-related chronic inflammation state? 
that is associated with neurodegeneration. And I'm gonna talk about just briefly um, one, there's many types of inflammatory mediators, but one that's very important is, is what we refer to as interferons or type one interferons. These are actually the molecules that are produced when our cells or our bodies are infected by viruses to counter the virus, to stop the virus from replicating. So these are strong and potent antiviral um, molecules, but they're also associated with age and age-related inflammation. And also there's been some studies that these are associated with, with Alzheimer's disease as well. And so we really wanted to kind of connect the dots and say, how does the history of viral infection that one experiences connect to the type one interferon production that's produced in cells with, with age and, and, and over, over time, could this in itself be contributing to this age-related chronic inflammation that can um, uh, occur with age and can contribute to neurodegeneration? And so I just wanna kind of walk you through a little bit about how we think about neuro uh, infl inflammation within the brain and what are the cell types that are involved in creating neuro uh, inflammation in the brain. Now we know a lot about the three major cell types of our brain. Um, the, the, the neurons here shown here in purple, that are producing the, 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 all the actions of our, of our body and the way we think and remember, remember um, and feel and, and, every, and all the sensations that we have. But these, we have to remember that these neuronal cells are, are highly supported by glial cells in the brain. And these are the astrocytes and, and as well as a, a brain resident immune cell uh, called the microglia, and that these pro provide very important supportive functions for neuronal health and brain health in general. But as one ages, what we see is that these cells, is particularly the microglia and the astrocytes, can start to become more inflammatory. They can start to become in a prime state that are then poised to produce more inflammatory molecules upon being stressed, or, or if they were physically exposed to, say, a virus. They can even have heightened inflammation responses to this. And we refer to this as prime microglia. But then of course, this can actually con convert to a more chronic state of inflamed microglia, where these cells now are, are even more inflammatory and they actually lose some of their neuronal supportive functions and could even become detrimental or even cytotoxic to, to neurons and cause death of these neurons. And so this is the transition that we can think of as we go with from from a healthy brain to aging, what we refer to as inflama aging, associating the inflammation that's associated with aging to even greater um, degrees of neuroinflammation and neuronal death. And it's really this state that we're trying to understand in my proposal, which is how do we generate this primed or poised state that these microglia can and, and other immune cells in the brain can develop into as, as a result of, of perhaps their prior history of, of signals and stresses that have might have driven them to this state? And then how does that also get triggered to drive them towards this more inflamed state that's uh, more associated with pro progression and disease progression and Alzheimer's disease? And so it's really understanding the, the generation of these prime types of cells and then the transition to these inflamed cells that we are uh, that we think contribute the most to disease that we are interested in trying to understand. And so I need to take just a step back to tell you why we started to think about this idea and how we started to think about work that my lab works on as it relates to this problem and how viral infection itself might be a potential environmental factor to consider in this regard. And my lab's been studying for many years how we develop long-term immunity. So again, something we've been thinking a lot about this year as we think about COVID and, and surviving COVID, developing immunity to COVID, but also getting a vaccine that can protect us from COVID because of the long-term immunity that that vaccine will engender in our, in our immune system. And so we know that long-term immunity um, is, is initiated in the first response we have to the viral infection or to a vaccine. And you can think about our immune system basi basically being equipped to do two fundamental jobs when you get exposed to the virus for the first time. The first job is to fight the present infection. We need to try to eradicate that pathogen as quickly as possible. But the second job is to fight the future infection to provide us with long-term immunity so that if we should re-encounter that pathogen again, we'll have a, a, a stronger, more robust ability to deal with that pathogen and to neutralize it as quickly as possible. And the main cell types that are involved in our immune system that are generated by the first exposure we have to that virus or to that, to that vaccines are, are what we refer to as our memory T cells and our memory B cells and also our long-lived plasma cells. 
And so our memory T cells are what my lab's been focusing on for many years, trying to understand how these cells form after the first infection or, or after a vaccine, for instance, but there was also these important antibody producing cells. These are all white blood cells in your blood. Um, these are, they're all lymphocytes and these memory B cells and plasma cells are what are secreting the antibody. So when you're getting your COVID vaccines, which I hope you all are, I'm sure many of in this room are already vaccinated, um, you were stimulating the formation of these cells to uh, generate anti-COVID antibodies in the case of the B cells or anti-COVID T cells mem and generating memory T cells that will hopefully protect you. Well, they will protect you to 95% confidence uh, if you were to be exposed to the virus again. And so this is just to show you how this kind of happens in real time when the host is first infected with a virus. So we have the, the virus, this is like your acute virus, this could be a common cold. And what you see here is that shown in here in line and the, the is supposed to show you the expansion of the cells that recognize the virus in your immune system. So these are these virus specific T cells that I was showing here. These T cells here, they don't exist in very large numbers at the beginning of the infection, but once they start to proliferate and they grow very rapidly, multiply, 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 they start to develop into these very potent effector T cells as shown down here that can secrete lots of antiviral cytokines and lots of interferon is being produced during this early stage of the viral infection to try to contain it. And these effector cells are very important for helping to get rid of the present infection. So we need to generate these T cells. We need to generate those B cells to produce the antibody to help get rid of the present infection. But after that has occurred, the immune system goes through a secondary phase, a, a contraction phase, and a, basically a returning to homeostasis, a resolution phase, where they then form this pool of memory T cells. And these are what are gonna stay with you for many years, decades. We know for people who have received the smallpox vaccine, that even 50 years later, we can still see memory T cells to the smallpox vaccine. And so these are gonna be able to become quite long lived and protect us for many uh, years to come. So these are the cells that are able to fight the future infection. So now you can kind of see how these two jobs were done. You were generating cells that, fought, that were uh, acting very quickly after the infection to fight the present infection. But then there was a small pool of these cells that was reserved over time to, to fight future infections. And we call these our long-lived memory T cells. And just to simplify this for you, there's basically two types of memory T cells. There's ones that circulate in our, in our blood and circulate throughout our tissues, but then there's other ones that just stay present in our tissues. We call them resident memory T cells. And that, and they become kind of the important player here in, um, in our proposal and our work because these memory T cells can form in basically every tissue of our body after the initial infection or the vaccine. And, and not all vaccines can generate memory cells in every tissue, but, but what we know is that these cells can form basically every tissue and they form in our barriers, like in our skin, in our gut, in our lungs, but they also form in, in non-barrier tissues like our brain, like our liver, like our kidneys. And so we can find these memory T cells that are basically sitting there long-term in these tissues to survey and protect against should they come into to re-encounter the pathogen, should it come again. And so I wanna focus on the brain because we can also find these long-lived memory T cells after a viral infection in our brain. And they come out of the blood as shown here, this is a blood vessel. They come out of the blood and they enter the brain tissue and they can reside in the brain for, for many years long-term. So what are they doing? What are they doing in the brain? And that was the question that we had knowing that these cells exist in the brain, what are the effects that they can have on this long-term age-related associated inflammation? And how does viral infection or the, or the number of viral infections that you encounter contribute to the age-related inflammation that's seen. So I'm gonna show you a little bit of data that we collected to, to try to start to examine this. And this is our, our very early for foray into this. So I apologize for not having a, a, a grandiose uh, 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 program here, but what we are trying to do is find some first hints at whether or not what we're thinking is happening is happening. And so our simple question was, is if you infect an animal, in this case, it's a mouse with a virus, the virus doesn't infect the brain itself. It actually will infect other tissues in the body, but it'll be resolved within a week. You can think about this as like the common cold for, vi for, for mice, for mouse viruses. And so it's gonna be infect, the mouse will be infected, but within about a week, it clears the virus. And then we asked, well, what happens to the brain after this? What happens to the cells in the brain? What happens to those glial cells in the brain, like the microglia? What happens to the T cells in the brain, these re brain resident T cells? And can we see kind of a long-term imprint on the brain 
as it, re as it relates to seeing this infection 60 days later. So are there any long-term consequences? And we were surprised to find that, yes, we could find these resident memory T cells in the brain. So that's just showing you here, this bar graph is the increase in these brain resident memory T cells that are in the brain, again, two months after infection. So we were able to form these long lived memory T cells in the brain, but they're also more functional and they can produce these inflammatory cytokines. So they can actually contribute to more inflammation in the brain because they're able to, they're there in the brain and they are, and they're able to produce more cytokines should, should they be restimulated. Stimulated. And so we wanted to then use this type of a model to go far, to go a little bit further and to ask the question um, a little bit more. And we also looked at microglia, sorry, I forgot to mention this. We also looked at microglia, these brain resident macrophages. And we asked what happens to them after this infection that the animal saw two months earlier. And we could also see these, I'm not gonna go into detail, but these are two indicators of activated microglia shown here kind of in, in orange that are actually enhanced by, and again, in looking at the red compared to the, the uninfected animals, you can see that there's enhanced activation of these microglia two months after this virus has been cleared. So what this suggested to us is that there are long-term changes in the brain in these animals after just seeing one viral infection. There's long-term increase in the number of T cells in the brain, and there's a long-term increase in the activation state of the microglia in the brain. And so we wanted to go one step further then and ask, well, what would happen then if this was to occur again and again and again, similar to the types of infections that we see in our lifetime? And could this then contribute to any effect? Could it have any effect on all progress the type of infection? How am I doing for time? I know that I'm only supposed to talk for 10 minutes. Am I pretty close to 10 minutes already? Or am I over? I'll keep, okay, okay. Uh, excuse me, a minute or two, Max. Okay, great, okay. So we put together three aims to try to ask this question, what does, the, what does the effect of multiple viral infections, serial viral infections have on these changes to the brain cells uh, in, in our brain? How does it affect the, the number of resident memory T cells that are accumulating in the brain? And how does it change the function of the microglia? And then we want to look to see if we if this was dependent, if these inflammatory changes that we see uh, are that are dependent, can they cause progression or hasten the onset of, of Alzheimer's disease using animal models of Alzheimer's disease where the animals are already prone and at risk to develop Alzheimer's disease over, over the course of their lifetime. But if we give them viral infections and create a, a more um, a severe or enhanced inflammatory state, would that actually hasten the disease, the disease in these models and cause disease to occur faster? And then we wanted to ask if this was dependent on certain inflammatory molecules in particular, coming back to this really important antiviral molecule, the type one interferons, which again is associated with age related uh, inflammation and, and we think could be a, a very important culprit in this um, age related uh, changes in severity of, of brain health. And the last thing we wanted to look at was to then determine specifically, are these resident memory T cells are forming in the brain after these infections, are these actually then required and, and, and important for sustaining this inflammation? <laughs> So I'm just gonna go very quickly into the, the design that we proposed. And what we proposed was to take um, either mice or we called control or wild type mice. There's just kind of your normal mouse. And then there's also these mice that are genetically programmed at, to, at risk to have Alzheimer's disease because they bear mutant uh, human proteins associated with Alzheimer's disease, such as uh, amyloid polyproteins and presenilin-1 uh, protein in mice. And so we asked if these APP PS1 mice that have these genetic uh, risks for Alzheimer's disease, we, we want to follow them over the course of their normal lifespan, but then we want to start to infect these animals with different types of viruses that these animals are, are, are that could lead to in some ways model the types of ways that we would encounter viruses over the course of our life, various types of viruses, various classes of viruses, such as um, an acute uh, LCMV virus, but also the flu virus or, or the vaccinia virus, which is a smallpox vaccine. 
And so we want to try to give these viruses to these to these animals in kind of a successive order, and then, uh, then look to see what happens later on, several months later now, looking one or two years over the course of the animal's life, what happens to the changes in, these, in, the, in the brain cells, uh, including the microglia and the T cells, but also what's happening to the neurons. And we'll be studying this from a variety of different ways, looking at the pathology of the brain, but also looking at the levels of inflammation that these cells are able to contribute to. And then in the second aim, what we're going to do is try to then block type one interferon, this antiviral molecule specifically. And we can do this by treating animals with drugs that will actually block the production of this molecule. So what we're hoping is that over the course of these different viral infections, once they've cleared these viral infections, uh, we will then look to see if there is an increase in chronic uh, in type one interferon production in the brains of these animals. And then we'll see if we can block that by treating the animals with drugs that will block it. Can we mitigate and reduce that? And then what effects would that have on Alzheimer's disease progression? So we're gonna try to ask more specifically how, those, how that molecule is involved. And then the third aim, what we're gonna try to do is then is after these cells have been infected multiple times, we're gonna try to actually get rid of these resi resident memory T cells in the brain, not allow them to be there, and then to again ask what effect this has on the long-term effects of, of age-related inflammation and, and Alzheimer's disease progression. So kind of three things that we're trying to explore here. One is how do serial viral infections contribute to the inflammation that's seen in the brain? Does it, haste, does it, ex, it enhance it? Does it increase it? We're also trying to ask them specifically, are antiviral molecules are produced because of these infections, then leading to, are they increasing over time as a result of multiple of the animal seeing multiple infections? And if we are able to block that, can, can we actually see any changes in the, in the pathology and the, um, and the age-related uh, progression of, of Alzheimer's disease in this model? And then the third is to get more specific and look at particular cell types and to see specifically if these T cells that enter the brain upon the animals being infected with these viruses, do they themselves contribute to the inflammation in the brain? So that's kind of the crux of what we're trying to trying to look at. And so I really want to thank uh, two key people in my lab, uh, Annalise Snyder and Dan Chen, who have really helped bring this uh, work to light, these ideas to light. And of course, we've been uh, collaborating a lot with Rusty Gage's lab and Nicola Allen's lab at, at the Salk Institute. And also, I want to thank the um, um, the uh, UCSD Alzheimer's Disease uh, Research uh, Center, which has been really helpful for helping us think about how we could also uh, obtain human samples to, to extend some of these studies. So with that, uh, I wanna thank you most of all for allowing me this opportunity for um, being able to explore these ideas and thank you for your enthusiasm. It helps give, give you confidence. <laughs> Uh, Sue, that was a fabulous presentation. Thank you so much. So Sue, we're hoping that you got a real check that your bank will accept this week, but we're going to do a virtual check presentation. So <laughs> well, there you go. Thanks Thank to the you. great artwork of, uh, of Tiffany Irwin. Uh, we've got a check uh, from Bill Parker and me uh, for $300,000. And so congratulations. We know that you're going to make us proud. Thank you. It means a lot to me. Thank you very much. Congratulations, Sue.